Hello, good evening. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Miguel Amado. I am the director of Sirius Art Center, an organization based in Cove, uh, County Cork. And um, I'm very happy to have with us today Alexandra Bologna, a curator based in Porto and representatives of Rampa, uh, an art space in Porto with whom we've been collaborating. Both Sirius Art Center and Rampa have uh, organized an exhibition uh, by Anthony Vidocal, which is currently on view at Rampa in, Por in Porto, Portugal. And together we have also uh, organized a series of uh, events um, that somehow help contextualize the exhibition by both engaging with issues related to Russian cosmism and also to issues that are um, connected with Anton's films. Um, I will hand over now to my colleague, Alexandra, who will do a, an introduction to our guest speaker today, Marina Simakova, and then we'll also hand over to, to Marina. The session is being recorded and we are hoping to upload it on uh, our YouTube channel and other platforms as well. So if you have any question with that, we suggest that you um, um, disconnect your camera. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's really a pleasure to have Marina with us and to also uh, start this series with um, our, our, our views on, on the topic and also to be able to work with an international partner uh, like Rampa and I believe that Rampa the same for, for us with respect to series. Hello everyone, my name is Alexandra uh, and I'm very happy to, to welcome our guest speaker, Marina Simakova, who is going to deliver a talk entitled a modern match between science and religion, a few notes on immortality in the Russian cosmism. Uh, in her talk, Marina reviews the conceptual foundations of immortality in the early Russian cosmism thought. Exploring its optimistic materialism, she demonstrates how technology and tradition, as well as reason and faith, were once fused within a daring project uh, of hopeful modernism. So Marina is currently a doctoral candidate at the European University Institute in Florence. Her research focuses on ideas of popular subjectivity developed within socialist circles in France, Russia, and Italy in the early 20th century. Her articles, essays, and translations have been published in Eflux Journal, Stasis, and Translate, among other publications. Thank you so much, Marina, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alexandra. Uh, and uh, yes, I, I'm very happy to be here. I want to thank Rampa and Sirius for organizing this series of events and for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts with uh, the international public. Uh, I'm really keen on speaking tonight. And even though I do not see all the faces at the moment, it's uh, a very warm feeling to know that there are people from around the globe. So uh, today I'm going to speak of the promise of immortality, which reemerged in its modernist form in the very end of the 19th century, thanks to Russian cosmism and uh, thanks to its founding father, Nikolai Fyodorov. And looking back at the key themes of modernity, which defined its main intellectual and cultural tensions, such as reason versus belief, evolution versus revolution, understanding versus acting, or technology versus tradition. One could say that uh, Russian cosmism faced these tensions with unprecedented openness. And it was an intellectual and moral pursuit for the practical solution, which aimed to save the very modernist thinking from falling apart under the pressure of these tensions and save humanity from its anomic state of non-kinship. What I'm going to do today is to, to offer uh, an explorative and problematized reading of the early cosmic thought in order to make it easier for us to understand what we deal with when it comes to cosmic ideas and why these ideas could come at hand in contemporary secu secular or post-secular, if you like, society. So immortality, which is the core of uh, my talk. Uh, 
there are many angles from which to view the cosmist approach to immortality. What I find crucial and particularly relevant these days is to address it in the light of the cosmist understanding of life. Why? Because it is human life in its crude biological sense that is the main topic of today. Life is threatened and prone to risks. Life is a primary object of universal concern and frustration. Life that is seen as something that is in need for security and protection. And during the last year and a half, this life has been rendered to its biological substrate, basically, suddenly manifesting its value and vulnerability. Life which man, main aspiration has become to run away from death as far as it could. And such attitudes to life, however, were present uh, way before we stepped into the new reality of global pandemic. It is, in fact, easy to locate them. They were present in what is called transhumanism, a series of projects and enterprises focused on technologies of life extension and expansion of bodily capacities, be they mental or physical. It has become actually quite common to see transhumanism and its projects as a continuation of cosmist thinking with its urge for uh, regulation of life processes and their enhancement, with lo which logic strives, at least hypothetically, to exceed its own limits for the sake of immortality of living organisms. But why does life need to be enhanced? simply because it is finite and everyone is mortal, always already at risk, which is why one seeks to expand the repertoire of opportunities to reach all the personal goals set and to be more efficient and productive than the others. This is where many contemporary transhumanist technologies, such as biohacking, for instance, come and meet the demand for fuller and longer lives of daring individuals. In this respect, I would argue that cosmism represents not um, a, a precursor, not a predecessor, uh, but rather a reversal of this transhumanist logic, which I'm going to further explain in a few seconds. So for Russian cosmists, unavoidable finality of life on Earth was also the question of paramount importance. However, Nikolai Fyodorov and his cosmist disciples refused to see human life as a journey from womb to grave, as a teleological process of gradual evolvement of the body leading to its destruction and eventually to death. On the contrary, they saw death as an ontological error, an error that is characteristic of being, which should be fixed once and for all. This means that for cosmists, death was less a biological problem, but rather the cosmological one. It was seen as the product of a sort of spatial temporal organization. That is the physical problem, which should be resolved by physical means. Uh, via overcoming space and time, basically. Furthermore, the biological substratum of life was not seen as deserving to be secured or protected because it was considered to be a spontaneous natural force lacking reflection and therefore lacking any considerable value. Rather, it was seen as a waiting to be radically transformed, to be infused with reason and faith, and by doing so, to make a leap from uh, elementality of life to its pure historicity. Cosmist immortality is not about making our individual lives longer, fuller, and memorable, but it is about making collective memory alive. And this is where the idea of resurrection, resurrection of the fathers, that is our ancestors, comes into play. And now 
Let me briefly show you what Fyodorov's cosmos was. He was a librarian, not a physicist. Also, he was a man of faith, not a scientist. And he believed uh, in the universe as God's creation. So one might wonder how his cosmology looks like and how does it work? How religion and science were reconciled in it? And now, hang on, I'm going to show you a slide. That's it. Yeah. Uh, the easiest way to grasp Fyodorov's cosmology, that is his fundamental picture of what being is, is to present it as a trinity. In fact, this cosmology has a clearly defined, defined trinitarian structure, but a materialist one. Here you can see the basic elements of Christian Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the, they, all, they are all consubstantial with, uh, with God, with God the Father. But in Fyodor, what we, we see is a materialist interpretation of this Trinitarian picture. So we can understand the figure of God the Father as um, a symbol of the physical world or matter, organic and inorganic. Mm -hmm. The force of nature which creates being out of itself and limits it by, by imposing on it its own laws. Then we have God the Son. And in Fyodorov's system, if we can say so, uh, because Fyodorov is very unsystematic in a way, uh, but still, if we uh, try to um, you know, derive the system out of his project, God the Son resembles organic life capable of evolution. Everything living and dying, coming into the world and living this way. And finally, we have the Holy Spirit, which resembles love, kinship, collective bond, or togetherness. On the right uh, section of the slide, you can see uh, the Trinity, the famous icon painted by Andrei Rublev in the first decades of the 15th century. It is a very important icon for Russian religious thinkers. And here, the Trinitarian parts, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit form a circle, a symbol of unity and eternity. Uh, the number of interpretations of this icon are you know, endless. And it is quite, uh, quite interesting that people who are trying to make sense of uh, this icon are still debating uh, which of them is the father, which of them is the son, and who is the Holy Spirit there. And what's important here is this image of a circle, a symbol of uh, ultimate togetherness in which they, they, are all, they are all come in one. Uh, and and uh, uh, the geometrical analysis of this icon also identifies this um, you know, ambition to manifest, uh, to manifest uh, in drawing geometrically the circle as a symbol of unity. But now one might wonder, uh, when it comes to death and immortality, uh, what, does it, what does it all mean? How death as a cosmological error could be fixed in this Trinitarian universe. Do we have a positive example we could follow? For Fyodorov, it is clearly uh, Jesus Christ who could overcome his biological nature in the act of resurrection. The act of all acts 
pointing the way for others to follow. Uh, you see on this slide that God the Son resembles an organic life. But this life is not to be saved and secured. It is pushed to its limits or uh, sacrificed. And here we can see that it is not the biological life that is at stake, but the past and future of humanity. What Fyodorov and other religious cosmists, uh, however, derive from the story of Christ is precisely the sheer materiality of, of what was happening to him. And the second thing which is very important for them is, the, is hope and determination, which made it all possible. You uh, might know the story how Christ laments on the night before uh, that, that, that the father has left him. But this hope and determination which helps him go, which helps him go further. And uh, <clears throat> hope and determination, the very basics of optimism guiding human action against all odds is for further the perpetual reservoir of the divine present in everyone and open to everyone, regardless of all our differences. And then Fyodorov's solution to the problem of mortality and for forgetfulness, which form the cornerstone of non-kinship is resurrection granted to all. If Christ was able to do it once, it's not uh, uh, only because of his divine nature, but rather the opposite, because he was one of us, because he was humane, but he, and this is why he was able to overcome his biological determination. And in Cosmic Project, uh, reacting to the challenges of modernity, including secularization, Fyodorov and uh, other religious cosmists aimed for the so-called final synthesis. The synthesis of what Fyodorov called two reasons, that is practical and theoretical, and three subjects, nature, God, and human beings. The synthetic nature of Fyodorov's thought appealing to science, religion, art, technology, popular culture, it proved to be very inspiring and versatile for many authors and, and for artists, of course. What is crucial in this way is to understand how these things are related in his enterprise. Because there's so much and uh, all these elements might seem so contradictory at first glance that I think it makes sense to, to understand what comes after the other, what, what is the sequence, how they're all related. Uh, and if immortality is posed as a resurrection for all, what does one start with? Where shall we begin with this task? And here I want to show you another slide, this time to illustrate further of practical solution, promising resurrection for all his practical solution, which uh, is known as the common task. The common task is basically uh, the title of the old Fedorov's uh, which was granted before when, when it all was um, published posthumously after Fedorov's death. And the common task at the same time is uh, uh, the name of, of the whole enterprise of uh, this resurrection for all. Actually, Fedorov's solution also uh, has a circular structure like the Trinity in Rublev's Ike. Since the key problem uh, Fedorov identifies in modernity falling apart is non-kinship, individualism, you start uh, not with the question of life and its enhancement, but with the step towards unification, 
with the common of the common task. You said it, uh, you said, uh, you know, immortality and resurrection as the common regulative idea. And only afterwards, you mobilize science and techniques, knowledge and art to gain immortality for the living and resurrection for the dead. So here it is very important to recall that Fedorovian cosmology is materialist. It is not described in the language of physics, precisely because physics here is rendered to be instrumental. For Fedorov, it is unable physics to is unable to describe what being is. Uh, but it is strong enough to affect being together with art and sciences for the sake of its transfiguration. So with its help, with the help of physics, uh, for example, one could, could overcome territorial locality, including the planetary, the planetary one. The universe for cosmos is the cosmic habitat, the infinite one. And this infinity is more than enough to welcome humanity as a whole, humanity as a mortal. And then after reaching this point, you get to the point of unification again, but on a different level, on the level of cosmic kinship of fraternity. Because if all generations exist at the same time, imagine, yes, the ancestors are resurrected. The living beings are uh, immortal. So humans previously divided into fathers and sons all become brothers. There is no generational inequality among human species. And for cosmos, it, it was very important to postulate the problem of inequality uh, in this way. They thought that social inequality is rather a result of this more fundamental, uh, you know, uh, material and, uh, mm, you know, generational inequality, the divide between mortals and the mortals, the divide between those who, who live and those who, who, uh, who, are, who are dead and who are being forgotten. So when you start from this point, all other kinds of inequality could be conquered. And uh, I think it is, a, it is a very interesting point, which I'd like to stress that uh, the, the uh, immortality for all or resurrection for all strives for this, uh, you know, absolute equality among human species. And here on the slide, you can see a geometrical model for this circular solution. Uh, I'd like to recall a very good description of nature um, given by Blaise Pascal in the 17th century. He defines nature as an infinite sphere. And uh, Pascal was both you know, a, a religious thinker and a famous mathematician. So he describes nature as an infinite sphere, the center of which is everywhere, the circumference of which is nowhere. This is the basic idea of infinity. But what Fedorov suggests in the you know, late modern era, and this is a very modernist gesture, is to place the common task as a practical mobilization in this omnipresent center of the cosmos cosmos. And eventually what you get, you get material transfiguration of the whole cosmos, including the human species. So uh, getting now to the very point of departure, I need to say that what Russian cosmos offers us today is a peculiar reflection of the universal and the cosmic materialist meaning of life, which goes well beyond its biological determination. And biological or biopolitical regulation, which seeks to protect 
our fragile bodies from dangers of organic nature manifesting their biological determination is simply not enough. What cosmists teach us is that life by definition uh, is much more than biology. It is a particular cosmic condition open for transfiguration and requiring collective effort and optimism. And the latter are non-biological features. Relying on them is the only way to deal with and conquer the dangers of biological origin. And this is, uh, I guess, my the final point of my presentation. I would be very happy to explore it in more detail and to elaborate on that uh, in the Q&A section. Thank you so much, Marina. Uh, Miguel, uh, I, first of all, I would like to ask our, our participants if they have any question, if they want to react, if they have any comment. Um, please go ahead or raise your hand or... It's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot to process, I guess, for all of us. Um, I, can, I can begin by... Um, mm. So, uh, picking up this idea that cosmism is a materialist um, constellation of theories and projects, of course. Um, okay, that I, th I think it also departs from this idea uh, from previous discussions that we had and previous readings uh, of, uh, of this idea of, of a common, of a, of, a, of a God that, of a universe um, that is a common substance um, in a way, in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't know if this materiality uh, that you are also talking about, that in a way tra um, crosses not only humans, but also it goes beyond um, uh, an anthropocentric view of the universe. Um, how, how can you, because in a way it seems also a very anthropocentric theory, mm -hmm. very much based on the resurrection of the humans, but it also tries to encompass the human as the universe and the universe as in very close relation with human being. So for me, there's a kind of a paradox, you know, between this, this materiality but that, is, that seems, yeah, that seems to a common task beyond the human, but at the same time, very much anthropocentric. Yes, thank you, thank you, Alexandra. This is a this is a very, I think this is a very good this is a very good question, and I think it's um, important to, to to address it now when we, you know, speak of cosmism and how. Uh, cosmic ideas could be like maybe uh, come at hand and brought hmm. life reinterpreted uh, in you know our contemporary reality. Uh, given uh, all the criticism the anthropocentric view has received throughout you know the previous decades. Mm -hmm. Well, first, mm -hmm. of course, uh, Fyodorov's project is anthropocentric. And I think uh, uh, this uh, we, we don't need you know to hide this mm -hmm. because it was simply impossible not to be anthropocentric in the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I um, I really doubt that it is uh, productive to claim that. Cosmism was non-anthropocentric from, 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 from the very beginning, and to search like for and to and to construct an argument, which uh, you know, mm -hmm. can, you know, substands this view. It would be simply ahistorical to say that. Yeah. But uh, it doesn't mean that 
<clears throat> we cannot read Fyodorov or other cosmists through the non-anthropocentric lens. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this is exactly how any revisionism, when it comes to theory, any productive revisionism would work. Uh, of course, for Fyodorov, the, uh, it is human being which uh, is granted with agency. It is a human being which was, uh, was created, uh, you know, by the image of God and which saves the, this uh, element of, uh, keeps this element of hope and self-determination. A very, you, you know, um, so the, which constitute a very strong subjectivity in a way, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, even a privileged kind of subjectivity. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> therefore, it is the common task is the task for the human beings. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, Fyodorov shows that this that this is a lot, which you know keeps us uh, uh, together. Which which um, uh, that there are many things we share in common with organic with other organic beings, mm -hmm. and this is first and foremost our organic nature. But uh, it. It is since he doesn't want to stop on this organic, uh, on the organic point of view and organic ontology and offers a cosmological mm -hmm. perspective. I think in space, in the universe, uh, we, we are all equal, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Please, Georgia. Hi, um, thanks, Marina, for your talk. I guess my question kind of leads on from Alexandra's. And um, I was wondering about this idea of returning to cosmism um, in relation to socio-political and ecological conditions, contemporary conditions, and how, um, what does this mean for the future of cosmist um, aesthetics and thinking in relation to, say, um, ecological catastrophe, and also ideas of terraforming, too? Thank you. Thank you for your question. When it comes to ecology, I think uh, here we can, we can trust Fyodorov and we can trust Cosmis because they were uh, among, uh, maybe they were one of the first thinkers who posed these problems seriously. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, for, 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 for them, um, the condition, the circumstances, the world turned out to be in the very end of, in the fin du siècle, yes, in the very end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, was a catastrophe. Uh, production reached uh, an unprecedented, you know, level of, of production, but what was being produced? Weapons and consumer goods. And uh, the episode of uh, terrible hunger, you know, took place here, here and there. And um, this is uh, this is the problem. Uh, like in Fyodor, of course, apart from his like positive project and his solution, there's a critical part. And uh, in many ways, he could be called a critical thing. So he criticizes this, uh, you know, condition, this uh, modern civilization precisely because it unreflectively produces so much which disappears in vain. 
or uh, which distracts nature. Yes, he says that nature is a blind, spontaneous, uh, spontaneous force, uh, and there's a need to infuse it with reason, with uh, element of uh, with an intellectual element, so to say, uh, in order to help it, you know, to uh, to, to help it or become its poor state. But it doesn't mean that he and uh, you know his, uh, his colleagues, uh, further cosmist authors, suggest for the destruction of nature. They were obviously not aware of how far can you go in the project of transforming the land, uh, you know, the, the human species, uh, and what are the challenges that await us on this way? But at the same time, ecology uh, was a burning question from the very beginning. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, uh, and in another part of your question about terraforming. Mm. This, this, this is interesting. I think uh, here the most uh, important example among the whole like, cosmist current is Vladimir Vernadsky, uh, who uh, offered uh, this idea of noosphere, uh, which is basically, could, which could be seen as a um, foretaste, as a, as a um, preliminary, preliminary um, concept of Anthropocene. If, if you read his text, what he, what, what he writes is that, well, the, uh, the, uh, he, he offers a biogeological approach first, and second, he says, look, uh, the land and the, the, the thin layer of the land uh, has been already transformed to a great extent. It has already been infused with, you know, uh, with, with human, with, uh, with culturalism, with, uh, with, uh, with the particles of uh, intellect on a, on a, uh, on a certain, on a, on, on a certain level, on a certain level, right? Uh, it, it's been, it is impossible to get back to nature as is, because such such nature doesn't exist anymore. So with the uh, terraforming, I think uh, <clears throat> Fyodorov could be seen on, only as the one who uh, sort of sees uh, or, or, or prescribes or predicts this condition of fusion and insists on its you know inevitability or even on its on its inevitability on its unavoidability and on its um, necessity but he yet doesn't think that it has been done and when it comes to vernatsky who comes to the fore Three decades later, it is uh, yeah. This this problem is uh, you know elaborated. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if there's someone else who would like to bring a question to discussion. Um, Miguel. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Marina. Thanks. Thanks so much for your talk and explanation. It was really fascinating, um, particularly uh, the explanation around the religious uh, background of Fedorov's ideas. Um, at the end, you were discussing ideas of inequality and kinship or brotherhood as a way of togetherness, as, which is infused, now the, these terms and these concepts are infused with some religious connotations, but ultimately, ideas of inequality and uh, addressing that by proclaiming inequality among all humans. And then of course, we already discussed the question around nature and 
the anthropocentric notion there. So um, equality among humans, but not necessarily among humans and other species. But okay, let's talk about equality among humans. So I'm, I'm more interested if you could just elaborate a bit on then the connections between ideas of equality among humans in Fedorov or in early cosmic thought and uh, ideas of equality as adopting socialist thinking um, that I guess I suspect was emerging or evolving around the same time that Fedorov was living and producing his work. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that if possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. This, this was the main, one of my main interests when I uh, started to look at the cosmic thought because a part of um, the intellectual history of this pre-revolutionary milieu. And uh, yeah, I, I'm really happy to, to, to talk about that. Before I, uh, I go this, to this, I, I, want, I want to tell um, another thing, getting back to this in uh, equality, equality between uh, various kinds of organisms and species. It's very interesting. But if, uh, the, if Fedorovian project, uh, which aims for transfiguration of the whole cosmos, uh, is realized, it is very difficult to say what human species become. And I think Fedorov was very well aware that uh, it might not be possible to call this new creatures humans. Uh, this is, if we go back to the uh, question. He didn't admit, or he didn't uh, predict that it will get to the point that all or all living organism, or organisms, or even maybe non-organic entities uh, uh, all become one horizontally, let's say, related. But at the same time, it is quite clear that if such, such a project implies uh, you know, radical transformation of the human species, there is, you know, it, it is very problematic to speak of human nature in this respect. And now uh, going to your question about inequality, social inequality. Yes, uh, what distinguishes Fyodorov and other cosmists from uh, many socialist, so, so, so let's say socialist thinkers and Marxist thinkers, or anarchist thinkers, uh, which, which was uh, uh, which uh, who come to the arena in the very in the end of the 19th century also uh, what distinguishes them is that um Fyodorov, Fyodorov doesn't agree that it is social inequality that we have to start simply because he sees that social inequality is not the core is not uh, the cause, but an effect of our uh, uh, cosmologic ontological inequality, this inequality between living and the dead. And he says, yes, I'm uh, against uh, capitalist destruction. I'm against um, militarism and production uh, and, and science and uh, technology which, which are totally subsumed by the logic of uh, you know production capitalist production on the one hand and you know uh, politics of the nation state on the other but at the same time he says that it is uh, if we start with economic socioeconomic inequality uh, we are still economists. I think this is the critique Marxist theory generally often received. Of course, there is much more in the Marxist tradition, which makes you doubt that it is an 
in, uh, in, in economist steel. But for Fedorov, it was like that. We are still trapped by the economic, uh, you know, by the economic problems and by the eco socioeconomic solutions. There is something behind all that. And also if we find, um, we find how to feed everyone say, and how to grant, to distribute wealth equally, for example, and how to grant everyone access to resources of a kind, um, we still have uh, several problems unresolved. It is procreation. It is, uh, uh, you know, for forgetfulness. It is this generational divide. And um, also the divide between uh, the, 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 the divide between uh, what he calls like knowledgeable and non knowledgeable. Th th those who, uh, um, you know, have access to university education and those who do not. And for him, it was uh, much, much more fundamental than the task of, you know, giving bread, uh, bread and bread to, to bread and um, bread and roses, bread, bread and roses to everyone. So <clears throat> that's of, of, of course, uh, it might seem as, you know, too much. If we cannot resolve this problem, let's just pose it differently. Let's just, uh, you know, pose a question in a more fundamental way. But that's what Fyodorov does. And I think what's productive about it, what's interesting is that it uh, gives you a certain perspective on, uh, on how we can, can look at these things. Of course, social inequality is one of his concerns. And he himself never studied in uh, you know, a big institution, he was a librarian. His uh, works have never been uh, published uh, during his lifetime. And uh, therefore he comes with this idea of library and museum as two institutions uh, which are open to all and which keep the knowledge, uh, but at the same time, do not impose it. Um, can we also relate this? Uh, so you were talking about, you, I think you finished your talk by saying that for Fedorov, um, he wants to think humans beyond bi bi biology. So, and here comes probably the relation that cosmism, I think, um, puts into art and maybe into knowledge in, or into museology, as you just spoke, as a, um, as a tool for, for this project of common task. I mean, how cosmism, maybe you can develop how, co for, how for cosmism, uh, how cosmism was an art project also in itself. Mm. This is, uh, this is interesting. Mm. Of course, I'm not uh, an art historian and not an artist and probably my colleagues would do it much better than, than me, but I'll try. Uh, I think it is quite possible to look at cosmism at, in our project in itself, simply because of Fyodorov's writings and it, it uh, applies to other cosmists as well, uh, is very incoherent. So he, ha he, he has many insights and he uh, has many interesting, strong intuitions, both critical and uh, positive. But it is quite impossible to say that this is, a, uh, you know, a logically uh, coherent system. Mm -hmm. Some elements of it are very coherent, but it demands additional, like, 
interpretation, in additional effort to, 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 you know, to construct it. And when we, and, and I think uh, it is both a fundamental advantage of cosmism and its main disadvantage because it's not treated seriously by philosophy. Philosopher, philosophy is, you know, uh, something which follows a very, which has a very particular, you know, ontology, epistemology, then practical philosophy. These things are all related together. Uh, they are all permitted by the classical logic. And um, Fyodorov sort of, I can say he despised this type of philosophizing, but um, uh, for him, it was, uh, of course, uh, like thinking in the ivory tower, mm -hmm. which is also inaccept in in totally inaccessible. It, it, it has its value, it's very interesting. And uh, it's, it's also like the, 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 leg the intellectual legacy he wanted to save and, and, um, uh, and build upon, but this is not the model to follow. And uh, uh, even though we say that Fyodorov's project and Cosmist project is um, modernist and therefore uh, suggests, suggests taking a certain totalizing perspective, which is, which is there. It is difficult, you, you, you know, to deny it. It's a, a very universalist approach and uh, it has this totalizing element which makes us so suspicious. But his, his uh, writings are very open. Are very, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, it is really impossible to create this uh, complete system out of them. And I think this is the only, uh, this is the only, Mm, th this is the particular moment which enables us to work with uh, his ideas, with Cosmist ideas today, because, because they are open, because they want to, 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 to remain open, or simply because they could not pursue their ideas, which are so radical and so, um, and may seem so crazy to a certain extent. Uh, it was impossible to argue them in the purely philosophical manner. And uh, that's why I think it's quite, and this is, this is what um, at least contemporary art do, does. It is reflexive, it is critical, and it is uh, open for uh, inter for any kind of interpretation. So in this respect, I think this is an art, this, this could be read as an art project. And this is why it is the artists who today, you know, work with these ideas much, much more than contemporary philosophers. I uh, uh, also want to recall uh, to, 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 remind, to remember that for Fyodorov himself, art is very important. And uh, uh, I think art is precisely where he sees this um, match between technology, or I would put it, not technology, techniques. Techniques and, uh, you know, culture, even popular culture. Uh, whether he speaks, he writes on architecture or popular dance, on folk dance, and these are his, his examples of art. Not, you know, uh, um, uh, Renaissance art or not um, uh, pointillist art, uh, it's, his examples of art are very practical. 
architecture or folk dance. Uh, this is where we see there is the element of technicality or techniques, so the, the, the knowledge of how to do it mm -hmm. without, you know, technological, logical, you know, big, big, big yes, 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 exactly. Uh, and uh, creativity. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, Marina, I, can I, if you have, we still have a little bit of time, if possible, if you're okay. Um, so, maybe, so you, while you were engaging with questions of modernity and, and you know, transitioning to discussions of uh, cosmism, you said that in your view, cosmism is not, uh, as we kind of say today, a precursor to trans transhumanism or this okay. idea of enhancing or prolonging life. <sighs> so my question, let's see if I can explain what I want to ask you. So like, even within transhumanism or this idea of prolonging life or enhancing life through technology, there is still um, the perspective that at some point death will occur. So death is inevitable. While the idea of prolonging life within cosmos has to do with the belief in resurrection or in the demand towards resurrection, not necessarily extending life, but basically preventing death, right? So can you tell us more why you think then is reversing this notion of transhumanism rather than seen as a precursor? Because in, in cosmism or in Fedorov, there is idea of immortality and resurrection. Both come along, resurrect those that already passed. Yes. But also, uh, so bring them back to life. And then those who are living, preventing their death. And that would be when everyone would be equal. They are equal in the fact that there is no separation, inequality among those who are living and those who died, right? Mm -hmm. So can you just tell us a little bit more about this connection with transhumanism and how you see it? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, the, yeah, I, I, I think this is, um, this is really important. I've been arguing uh, about this a lot with other colleagues because within transhumanist culture, uh, it is possible to meet people who claim that they continue cosmist and cosmist uh, enterprise and they see cos and that they that they're inspired by it and that cosmism was very influential and they. Yeah, uh, rely on that. Uh, yeah, it is. It is so, and uh, uh, I. Uh, this is yeah. This is quite so, but I think it it doesn't mean that they continue Cosmos project. They continue. They take some elements of it and uh, and work with them. And I. I'm not sure whether cosmism was that necessary to go on uh, with the transhumanist, uh, transhumanist ideas. In, in my perspective, transhumanism has a totally different intellectual origin. It derives from the new age, from the American new age, of uh, you know the it's the it's the seventies, it's also a particular fusion of of you know uh, religious aspirations with uh, the appeal to science, but it's it's totally different, and uh, um, that is why when transhumanism claim that cosmos cosmos are their predecessors. <laughs> You know, I cannot do anything about they they read them and they find them inspirational, but I, we as those who are trying to make sense of it, uh, I think um, need to be reminded that the, the intellectual origins of transhumanism are elsewhere, and they say much more. More, and if we go back to this new age culture, we understand much more about how transhumanism functions and why it functions this way and why uh, transhumanist 
projects develop the way they develop. So um, getting back to your question, sorry for being so, so talkative on that. Um, the reversal of uh, the logic is the following. Yes, it's not only about resurrection, it's also granting immortality to those who are living, but from the perspective of resurrection. So it's, uh, it's kind of assuming that uh, getting immortal is, uh, let's say, prem premature resurrection. But it doesn't explain how, how it could be done, right? But for him, resurrection is an example, not a magical, you know, pill which enhances uh, your uh, bodily capacities. And, uh, and it's quite interesting. For example, he writes on morphine and he says, yes, morphine uh, can help you, you know, deal with pain. But it's, it creates a totally different experience of, um, um, well, he calls it an illusion, but I would call it, you know, a, um, a, a different kind of experience of, uh, you know, uh, expanding the horizons of your, uh, you know, sensual and cognitive perception, uh, or, uh, you know, affecting your uh, bodily processes. And for, for further, it's very important to remain sane in a very conservative, uh, you know, uh, way of understanding sanity. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, not to look for this uh, temporary uh, formative or transformative experience. So, um, a resurrection is still an act, possibly a collective act. And uh, uh, again, this is something which requires for him a very strong subject. Uh, the subject who is not ready to dissolve in, you know, what in, in experience. It's materialist, but it is uh, uh, less, let's say, empiricist in a way. Okay, I have a f uh, yeah, Austin, please. Yeah, just one one brief um, uh, uh, query. Uh, you, you, you use the example of the the, the relationship of. Uh, you know, like you have, you have God, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost uh, earlier, and that, that that was sort of interesting. Um, but it, one of the promises of, of religion, and well, certainly of Christianity, is everlasting life. That's part of the big cell. And part of that is that we will get to meet our, uh, well, our ancestors. That's the promise, isn't it? That we'll meet yeah. everyone that ever, ever lived, ever. And that's that that's uh, that's meant to be a good thing. And in cosmism, that you know, you were suggesting earlier that uh, part of it, part of it is to 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 reduce or eradicate the the the, the inequality between the living and the dead, um, you know, as, as an idea. So that being the case, is there any? How do you describe the conflict or the tension between earlier cosmos thinking and? contemporary religious thought or contemporary religious philosophy, theology? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. All, all questions are uh, very to the point. Uh, I mean, I'm so happy we, we have this time for discussion. Uh, uh, yes, when it comes to theology, it's also very important to, uh, to, uh, to remember that theology was never a, str a strong point in Russian intellectual environment and in Russian culture. Uh, for good or for bad, uh, Russian religious thinking is very different from the tradition of Western theology. Uh, and <clears throat> yes, uh, they, do work with Easter with uh, some writings of the Eastern Orthodoxy of Eastern Christianity of the Orthodoxy, but uh, first it is 
slightly a different uh, tradition, you know, which didn't go through, uh, you know, the fathers of the church and the scholastics. And, uh, you know, th there was never a tradition of theology of, you, you know, this deep theological education with long theological debates on, um, uh, you know, the question of uh, uh, grace, uh, for mm -hmm, example. Mm -hmm, yeah. And, <clears throat> and uh, uh, so some key concepts from, uh, you know, Catholic or Protestant theology, which are so, 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 so crucial for, 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 the, for the whole history of theology are simply absent in these writings. Okay. And, and, and uh, uh, you, you know, for example, when I speak of optimism and hope, mm -hmm. this, 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 uh, this is very, uh, this question, this problem has been addressed many times through uh, the concept of grace and how a person, whether like the person has free will to, uh, to uh, accept this grace or whether the, whether, you know, free, free will, free will uh, is non-existent and the grace is given and all these things. But further, it's simply not the case. He doesn't work with these concepts. And I must confess, that he uh, he's barely familiar with them. Okay. That's, uh, <clears throat> you know, I never, uh, it is difficult to check how much uh, Western theology he read. I'm sure that he was familiar with uh, some classical writings, but uh, Russian religious thinking is very frivolous, if I may say so, in the way it deals with theological matters. And this is, again, why I think uh, Fyodorov's project, the Cosmist project, uh, is more like a, an art project than the philosophical one. Okay. And when, yeah. Uh, so when, when it comes to contemporary theological uh, debates, uh, I don't know what subject to pick, like what is post-secular and what is spiritual, what is the, stat the status of spirituality? Because I think one of the uh, most um, uh, heated debates is that now in post-secular world, we deal with uh, like different bits of spirituality and people claim to be non-believers, but at the same time, uh, phenomenologically or just structurally, their life is uh, their, their, their life is structured with semi-religious rituals. Uh, people have various kinds of beliefs or uh, belief systems, and um, and uh, spirituality is pretty much there in, um, again, even some transhumanist, uh, uh, transhumanist uh, techniques of mindfulness, mm -hmm. things like that. But uh, it is, uh, again, totally, totally alien to the cosmos uh, and, and, and enterprise. Uh, what Fyodorov really aspires for is to, uh, so is a certain, uh, of course, it's a certain renaissance of, of the Russian orthodoxy, but what he starts with is um, not, the, not a theological debate, but rather, um, but rather the fact that in Russia back then, there was um, a big thing, uh, the coexistence of uh, official, orthodoxy and uh, religious and pagan or semi-pagan religious rituals. And especially in popular culture, there was such a fusion of this, of this too, uh, that it was very difficult to say from uh, what, uh, what's the, what, what, what's the, it was 
and uh, and uh, it was possible to see that in one village there was one fusion and another one it's another and it is called double belief and uh, i think it's it's very interesting um and since Fyodorov attends to popular culture, and particularly, he sees his this double belief, unlike, uh, unlike those who represented the official church at the time, he sees this double belief as a resource, as something we can learn from, as a popular religious culture, which uh, makes religious uh, religion uh, alive and uh, which takes religious uh, mainly from the point of practices, which values the feeling of community, of religious community, and not, you know, the, uh, the doctrine, the, the set of doctrines. And it is uh, quite just, uh, yeah, just, just to know, it is quite, uh, interesting that the majority of religious debates uh, throughout Russian history also deal with the practices. They, and and, and with, with the ritualistic and practical part of, uh, of uh, religion and not with doctrinal, not with dogmatics. That's why it is almost impossible to read further from the theological point of view, because it, it is not theology. It is religious thinking, but it is not theology. Okay, thank you. Um, I, see, I have a, another question too. Is that okay, Marina? Are you still okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Um, it's just, it's a more a curio uh, question that has to do with the fact that, okay, so, if in the early 20th century in Russia, um, ideas around immortality and resurrection, I would suspect they would be appealing. And there has been, there were different uh, uh, thinkers um, that took Fedorov's ideas further. But say within, say, and then there was questions around uh, Soviet Union and the thinking around cosmism and the suppression of that. But I was wondering, why do you think somehow, or maybe I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, that somehow this kind of thinking kind of dissolved and became obscure or disappeared from mainstream even say in Russia or not. And somehow it took almost like a century or 70 years, or, mm -hmm. this, or maybe the fall of the Berlin Wall, I don't know, to have to see it reemerge, or, or its reemergence is aligned with, an, a re, with revisiting ideas of the body and mind, but also with the now more realistic possibility of colonizing other planets or of extending our life by technology through technological or medical apparatus so maybe that's today that's because that's so concrete and possible or potentially possible maybe we could reconnect with this thinking but do you do you have any comments on these potential gaps or lack of continue continuities between uh feather of thinking and today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes thank you for the question uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. Uh, there, there, are two, there, there are two answers. One is um, rather simple and the other one is uh, quite complex. So the first, the simple answer would be is that uh, Fyodorov's philosophy as well as uh, cosmism of those who work uh, as a non-religious cosmism of those who sort of developed his ideas and worked during the Soviet times, it was uh, uncompatible with the uh, official philosophy of the party. It was uncompatible with, uh, you know, um, the, uh, the rigid form historical materialism took in uh, 
you know, in, in the late 20s and in the 30s in particular. And uh, most of all, its uh, religious and spiritual character was something which is, so it's just like the, the, the very idea of, uh, you know, cos cosmic being and universal, uh, and yeah, co co cosmic being and um, let alone resurrection uh, w was uh, incompatible with the official philosophy or even the evil culture. But also, uh, of course, this religious moment, this uh, in Fedor's insistence on the importance of uh, religion, even if he interprets religious picture, uh, ontology, religious ontology in the material sense. No, there's too much talk about God, about Jesus Christ, about um, uh, religion. So it, it, it couldn't, it, it was simply you know, unimaginable um, to be read and developed and revised. And, um, and also uh, Fyodorov was um, quite, quite radical in some respect and quite conservative uh, on the other hand. Uh, in the end of the day, his, his um, common task is, um, you know, a modernist way of, uh, you know, insisting on how, tra how tradition is important and resurrection of the dead and this unification with the ancestors is the material um, expression, is the material manifestation, materialization of tradition and memory. So uh, again, there was no room for, for it uh, during the Soviet times. But apart from ideological, you know, uh, differences and uh, uh, the rigidity of the Soviet, uh, of, 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 uh, of historical materialism and dialectical materialism, the rigidity of their particular versions in the Soviet times, there's another thing, which is more complex. And I faced it when I wanted to see how much cosmism, uh, is there any cosmism in Soviet space program? Because it's about sending a man to space. It's about conquering, uh, you know, locality, if we use Fedorov's words, uh, and it's about sending humanity to the universe. And uh, Tsiolkovsky, the one who invented the engine for spaceships, uh, came to Fedorov's library when he was, uh, he was a kid. So there's a particular line. But how, but of course, with this um, mythology and, uh, you, you know, flourishing discourse around surrounding Soviet space program, there's nothing about cosmism. And there's nothing about Tsiolkovsky as the author of cosmist, uh, you know, he, Apart from his scientific work, he had his own like uh, ideas of what cosmic humanity could be and how the life would be organized, how they live in the interplanetary space. These works were not published during the Soviet times. Uh, so I was really wondering, is uh, how uh, how this all works and. Is there any element of cosmism in Soviet space programs? And I uh, found out a very particular moment of rupture between them. And it is not about ideology, which is, which is of course very important. And uh, the fact that nobody simply had the access to Fyodorov's writings 
because they were um, not published uh, and uh, almost forbidden, you know, to read. But uh, I looked uh, at the context of Soviet space program and found out that uh, one of its additional, let's say, uh, goals, except for the space race and geopolitics and development of science, was um, dissemination of uh, atheist views. It was what was called then uh, scientific atheism. And scientific atheism is a particularly Soviet invention that atheism has to be uh, uh, argued and uh, you know um, grounded uh, by science, by scientific, uh, by science, by science, by, by scientists, and <clears throat> and uh, um, there are many stories around them. Uh, some of which are very funny. For example, uh, some cosmonauts when they were back. Uh, from space missions, they were sent with a tour uh, along the country to sort of enlighten people that there's no God in space. They, they saw no God in space and, uh, uh, and, and, and therefore to confirm that atheism is the only possible, you know, way of looking at the world. So what happened? They Mm, held public lectures on how they went to space and uh, how there's no God and what they see stars and planets and uh, how spaceship works. And then people from the, the audience uh, said, okay, we believe you that you were in space. We were not there. We believe you that you saw the universe, you saw the stars and the planet looks like this, like you describe it. Uh, but why don't you believe us that God exists? Uh, there were many funny stories uh, like that. And at some point, I don't remember the name of the cosmonaut, but he said, look, I cannot go on with this uh, athe scientific atheism propaganda because I simply lack religious education. And if I want to argue against religious worldview, I need to know something about religion. And then I found out that, um, and, and, and you know, planet, uh, planetariums, uh, the, the, uh, the observatories are often um, built in the former churches. And uh, this was one of the tasks of building the planetarium is to attract the audience to, to make them look at stars and to see that there are planets. But uh, of course, the idea of God is not about seeing somewhere on the skies, right? And uh, it didn't work. In fact, uh, uh, the results of this Mm, anti-religious campaign and the scientific atheism was the increase of amount of believers of, of, the, of the ones who go and actually baptize secretly. Uh, but what I also find interesting in this respect is that if we deal with scientific atheism and its program and myths uh, which surround the Soviet space program, we can see that it was a purely idealistic model. It was about myths. It was about ungrounded, uh, you know, atheism as an idea. Uh, I, I unfortunately I don't have uh, you know time and, and, and probably everyone is there to go into detail, but that's how I see the moment of fundamental rupture, Soviet space program, and the Soviet understanding of religion was ignoring its material part, its practices, its rituals, its, its 
the materiality of uh, resurrection, the fact that people are res in the end of the day resurrected in blood and flesh. We don't, of course, it's a different blood and flesh, but still it is very, this uh, material elements of religious doctrines are very important and they are especially important when it comes to cosmism because, because cosmos uh, space is material. Is material. So that, well, that would be a more complex answer, I guess. Thank you so much, Marina. This was, this answer was great and just opened a lot of um, interesting alleys, but uh, for another time, I guess. Um, maybe, I don't know if there's maybe one last question or one last comment. Um, or if not, uh, would you like to leave maybe an optimistic, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, line or idea uh, from cosmism into contemporaneity, maybe just to, because this is what, what was all about, about uh, hope and uh, trying to see um, how other discursive, uh, how, how cosmism could be also seen as an optimistic movement. Yes, yes, I think this is um, this is what I started my talk with. I I'm quite surprised that today, when we talk about like when, when the times are really turbulent, and when we uh, speak about where our frustration comes from, and uh, how we deal with this instability and threats. Uh, during the pandemic, um, we, uh, all, we always receive the messages uh, about production and security, and uh, which, is, which are alarming which, and which bring only more frustration. And I think all the measures which are being made, uh, which are be, be, be being like, which are taking place, measures of you know safety and health, health protection. Uh, they are also how they are advertised, how they are discursively formulated, that this is all for protection. And I think what cosmists really teach us is that. If we do these things, uh, or if we go on our work, our scientific inventions, our creative, you know, collaborations, um, or our just uh, daily reflection, it is not because we are, you know, trembling from fear and angst, and we want to protect what we have, but rather uh, because we, you know, we hope that tomorrow will be a new day and uh, we can bring something new and meaningful to it against all odds and against all the challenges, which sometimes convinced us that, you know, we are uh, convinced that sometimes make us think that we are, uh, we cannot do anything really changing, transformative, that we are passive, that there's uh, no, you know, th there's no, there's no mm, source of agency in the world of in such a disruptive state. So I guess my optimistic message would be uh, about this, to remember that there's always agency and agency is not about, you know, uh, a particular set of action taken, taken, taken or measures we create and, and implement, but it's about 
you know, hope, it's about the openness to mm -hmm. act. Thank you so much. Such a beautiful idea, Miguel. Marina, thanks so much for your um, for engaging with us today. It has been absolutely fascinating and incredible to hear you and the and the vastness of knowledge that you shared with us. It's absolutely incredible. Thank you so much again. Uh, so just uh, as a footnote, uh, Marina's uh, talk today was the first of a, uh, a group of four that we are producing online, presenting online. So next week we have Rocks Media Collective, uh, uh, collective of artists based in India, uh, in dialogue with Anton Vidokal. And then we will have Boris Groy's uh, lecture. And finally, we will also have a lecture by Michael Marder. Um, we also had the opportunity of having uh, Kathy Shukrov in Porto last week, uh, doing a lecture, presenting a lecture and, so, and also engaging in a conversation. Both, uh, all of the um, sessions will be, have been recorded or will be recorded and we'll make them available. And we look forward to seeing you next week and following that. The same Zoom link um, functions, so we don't need to register again. You can just show, just come back uh, next Thursday, 7 p.m. Uh, Irish time or British time or Portuguese time. And again, Marina, thanks so much for your time and generosity. Uh, I hope we will have uh, other opportunities of engaging with you. And um, Nuno, do you want to say anything on behalf of Rampa? Thank you very much to Marina and all the participants. We certainly look forward to the, the next session next Thursday. Thank you. Thank and, you so much for making it. Indeed. And thank uh, you. Thank yeah, you. I was very happy to be here tonight. Yes. Thank you so much and have a nice evening. All right. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.